Hi, welcome to Just Thinking Out Loud. My name is Desiree. Have you ever found out about a piece of work, maybe one of my videos on this channel that you wanted to look into, but you sit down and then you realize just how much effort you're going to have to put in to actually get it done? That's what happened to me when I decided that I wanted to read about the Gulag Archipelago that has been promoted a lot by Jordan Peterson. It's taken me some time to get around to this, but I'm doing it and I'm going to do it in sections. First, I'm going to tell you why I'm interested beforehand. I've already read some of it, but I'm still at the beginning and I'm going to tell you even before I started reading what I thought so that you can see at the end when I'm finished with it if my opinions changed at all. And then I'm going to orient you, the audience, because this piece of work is really hard just to structure in your head about where you are in it just because of the way it's written. And then I'm going to give a brief summary of each section. Again, this is only the beginning of it. And then I'm going to give you my overall reaction, things that stood out to me, what I thought. So both an analysis and then sort of highlights. And I'm going to end with a quote. I think I'm going to make that a tradition uh, for each video that I do on this topic. It won't be that many videos, but I am going to have to take it slow because it's taking me a long time to go through everything. Oh my god, what am I doing? So the Gulag Archipelago is something that I've heard of within the context of being anti-Marxist because of the horrors that were carried out in Russia under the Soviet Union, under uh, both both Lenin and Stalin, but particularly in terms of Stalin, and something that is sort of hard to understand if you just jump into the text is that the whole reason why this was occurring was based off of a Marxist revolution that happened beforehand from the Tsars and autocratic rule. So it was a revolution to help the people and then it ended up killing a lot of people, the numbers aren't quite clear. I'm going to link to a video of that. For the human meaning of a regime dedicated, as the Soviet regime was, to the twin pillars of violence and lies. In an important note appended to the first chapter of volume two of the Gulag Archipelago, The Finger of Aurora, Natalia Solzhenitsyn pays tribute to the seven volume history of the Stalinist Gulag, this work shows precisely what the official documents revealed about the camps, and I should add, during the Stalin period, not the 20s, not Solovki, not the Lenin period, really beginning with 29 or so, or 30. 800,000 800, people shot, 20 million people passed through camps, colonies, and prisons during this period. Um, special populations, kulaks and deported peoples constituted another six million people. Over five million people were detained in camps or special vi villages under the surveillance of the MV MVD at the time of Stalin's death in March 53. But these statistics do not begin to tell us the full truth about the extent of Soviet repression after 1917. As Oleg Klevniuk documents in a very important book, Stalin, New Biography of a Dictator, published by Yale University Press in 2015, eight million people died in the Russian Civil War. Five million people died in a famine largely caused by Lenin's draconian policy of war communism. I'm talking about the late teens and early 20s not talking about the famine of the 30s. Um, whole peoples like the Don Cossacks were subjected to what only be called genocide. Half of the Don Cossacks died in 1920, 21, 22. Um, at least five to seven million pe uh, peasants perished in southern Russia, the North Caucasus, and the Ukraine uh, in 1932 and 1933 mainly Ukrainian, but many Russians, and, uh, and also a third of the people of Kazakhstan perished during that period. And during the Great P Patriotic War, millions perished or were punished for retreating from the advancing German army. Klevniak writes that, on average, over the more than 20-year span 
of Stalin's rule, one million people were shot, incarcerated, or deported to barely hospitable areas of the Soviet Union every year. I should add, one doesn't turn to the Gulag Archipelago for precise numbers regarding the number of people killed or imprisoned during Lenin and Stalin's rule. Solzhenitsyn's estimates were that, just that estimates. They're a little bit on the high side. And as for the total loss of life under Lenin and Stalin, conservative estimates from Nicholas, Nicola, Nikola Vert in the Black Book of Communism go from 20 million. Alexander Yakovlev, who was in charge of the Presidential Commission on Repression under Lenin and Stalin during the, both the Yeltsin and, and uh, uh, Putin years, uh, estimates, uh, estimates about 35 million victims of political repression and government instigated famine. Nevertheless, Solzhenitsyn rightly captures that this was a calamity of the first order with millions, even tens of millions, perishing at the hands of an ideological despotism. He dramatically chronicles what applied ideology can do to both the bodies and souls of human beings. My general idea was that Marxism is bad because this is what happens in practice and the Gulag Archipelago is just a recounting of what happened in Russia but it's been similar to say the Maoist revolution what happened in China and I had only ever heard of it in the context of how bad it was before looking at this. That's already changed a little bit but it's basically a recounting of horrors under Marxism. So, so, <laughs> and Solzhenitsyn is kind of a hero the way he's portrayed, his writings at least. That's how internet ethos, because I, I didn't study this stuff in school, so this is something that I've really found out about, I guess mostly through Jordan Peterson, but other people talk about that online. Other than the context that I've heard the book in, even though I've only heard of it in a Marxist context, I already think that this sort of group thing, totalitarianism can be espoused by any ideology so i don't just think it has to do with marxism that's why i'm going into it but i realize that this has specifically been seen with marxism so that's my overall opinion before i get into it now in terms of orientation with the book i downloaded the book i also downloaded the seven part video series that's on youtube and i mostly listened and the text is very difficult to go through it's like very long and he has entertaining as in literarily interesting a writing style of course what's being said is very important but it was difficult i had to make myself focus when i was reading or listening both actually because i use the text as a guide uh, to go along and then i also had to look up a lot of terms like for example, SAR can be spelled C-Z-A-R and T-S-A-R. That seems really simple, but that's stuff I didn't know. Like, who are the Bolsheviks? Those are the people who were led by Lenin, who was a person who was there before uh, Stalin. Uh, so Stalin took over from Lenin, and the Gulag Archipelago specifically focuses on the Stalin period, and all of this happened, I think, 1917 was when the Bolshevik Revolution happened against the Tsars, and it was a communist overthrow. And there's something called the Red Guard and the White Guard, all of this stuff. There are the different secret polices or just polices that Russia had, the NKVD, the GPU, the OGPU, the NKBG, the MGB, the MVD, the Cheka. Mostly in the book I saw GPU so far and NKVD and they changed their names over time. Also what the acronym GULAG means, it's a Soviet penal system under Stalin and it's the Russian acronym for a chief administration of corrective labor camps operated by the OGPU. I tried to look up if Soviet had an inherent meaning I couldn't find one it just seemed to refer to the Russian USSR uh, just that whole communist movement they just use the term Soviet but I don't know what the etymology of that word is I also wanted to orient myself geographically so I found a couple of maps that show Russia and then where all the different prison uh, labor camps 
the prisons and labor camps were, and that's what Solzhenitsyn refers to as the Gulag Archipelago, and it's where people were sent, many of them. Also, in the middle of the book, it's clear that World War II is happening, and that has an effect towards the end when there are prisoners, prisoners of wars that come back, which I'll mention briefly. And for the book, it was written by Solzhenitsyn based off of letters, memoirs, notes, and his own personal experience, and it served to give a human face to what was happening. Also, his first book also spoke about prison life, and that was called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. And then later he published the Gulag Archipelago after a positive response to A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. So there's a lot going on in terms of the context behind this. And it, the most important thing to me, which I think isn't very clear when you just jump into the book, is that all of this was due to a communist revolution meant to make things better for everyone and it ended up being well arguably worse and then in terms of the book structure itself well that's a trip because there are seven parts but three volumes and so in the first volume there's part one and part two and i go through the first six chapters in this video of part one in volume one. So then there's also part two in volume one, and then in volume two, there's part three and four. And then in volume three, there are parts five, six, and seven. The way it's broken up doesn't really make sense. Part one's a lot longer than part two, so I only go through chapters one to six in this video. And I'll put screenshots so you can see what the different volumes are and orient yourself visually and I'll draw a line showing exactly where I stop so you can follow along. By the way, did you know that USSR means Union of Soviet Socialist Republics? I didn't know that. I kind of just thought it was like an old term for Russia. Like I didn't think it was, I didn't know what it stood for. I should mention that I am Jamaican, so like what I learned growing up was primarily Caribbean history and they taught us general world history like enlightenment, renaissance, that kind of stuff, but I don't remember any of it. Any of it. Like I don't remember the dates, I always have to remind myself. And so all the focus was on mostly Caribbean history and then since I've been in the US, I've mostly heard about American history. So all of this is sort of novel to me, which is why I'm interested because I get bored a little easily intellectually, definitely not in the rest of my life. Solzhenitsyn was born in 1918, he died in 2008, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1970. Solzhenitsyn was an officer who fought in World War II, but he was arrested for saying the wrong things politically in 1945. And then, and I think he spent eight years in the forced labor camps. And that's a good place to start because the chapter title and what begins in volume one, part one is arrest. Solzhenitsyn himself was arrested because he was condemned to be part of a group involving two people criticizing Stalin. And it was really personal correspondence by mail between him and a friend and that's why he went to jail. I think a good quote that sums up this chapter is, you are under arrest? Me? What for? What he talks about in this chapter is how so many people were being arrested for they didn't know what and because they didn't know why they were being arrested, they couldn't even defend themselves. He also mentioned that this mostly came from areas outside of the city, so a lot of people inside the city weren't even aware of what was going on. I do liken this to, in a much, much, much softer form, to people watching other people get cancelled and thinking that it won't happen to them. And that's really what this whole chapter talks about, how so many people right under the eyes of everybody else got sent to these labor camps and people didn't think it was going to happen to them and so when people thought it was wrong but didn't say anything so when people refused to say anything because they were afraid and he calls all the people doing the arresting the organs they would go and find people in the middle of the night if people were a part of the military they would tell them that they had been offered a new position for example and then trick them send them to a camp Chapter 2 is called the history of our sewage disposal system and in this one he talks about the different sets of people who get sent to the camps. There were people who were parts of political parties, people who were against the communists in the Russian Civil War, intellectuals were also sent, Tsarist state officials, 
peasant hostages, people within the Bolsheviks who weren't liked anymore, engineers, he spends a good amount of time talking about the engineers and how sometimes engineers would say, no, this wouldn't work, but they would say that they were just against the state and would send them into labor camps. He also talks about the kulaks, which originally referred to peasants, I'm going off of Wikipedia, with eight acres of land, and it basically referred to anyone who owned property. And that definition really grew over time to really mean anyone, like you could barely own anything, and if your neighbor didn't like you, then you would get sent. There's also a specific article Article 58 of the Criminal Code that's mentioned, basically any action can be used as a charge under this article. For example, any action directed towards the weakening of state power, propaganda or agitation in order to overthrow Soviet power, also the sharing of literature that had anything to do with, I guess, criticizing the government. And they also had arrests for quotas, and so they would just find people to fill them. He talks about collective farms. There were a lot of non-political offenders. I think later on in the book, a lot of people were sent from the cities to go and work on these collective farms. He mentions a particular incident about uh, someone being arrested for a spool of thread, and they described it as 200 meters of sewing material in order to make it sound like something important. Chapter 3 is called the interrogation and this just gets into all the torture methods and ways they get people to admit and confess to a crime that they weren't guilty of and they will use a lot of physical torture. He does mention that just sleep deprivation and starvation would sometimes be enough and that was the majority of cases but they would also beat people with rubber truncheons and they'd also threaten hurting close family members and it wasn't enough to just confess about yourself but they wanted you to drag other people along with you and he mentions that one of the things he was really happy about Solzhenitsyn was that he didn't bring anybody else along with him because that was something he was worried about. He talks about priests being dragged by their hair, men being dragged by their mustaches uh, with pliers. He also talks about having a man lie down on his back and then both male and female guards giving them 15 seconds to confess before they would crush their sensitive parts and there were many people who had already been arrested who would tell people just confess because eventually they'll realize how absurd it is that so many people are being arrested and then they'd all get let go but that's exactly what the organs wanted and this is to bring as much people along as possible and that was not helpful at all so just keep confessing so chapter four is called the blue caps and that refers to all the people doing the arresting i think that the personal life of Alexander um, kind of mirrors the descent of many people because he himself was an officer and he talks about how he used to do these petty things to try and get people in trouble and stroke his ego and this is the same kind of behavior that allows people to watch as their fellow citizens are being mistreated. Sometimes they wanted to get back at them thinking it wouldn't happen to them and he also talks about how the blue caps they themselves would be punished sometimes even though they were meeting out punishment uh, onto other people. He talks about many people not wanting wanting to join uh, the Blue Caps, trying to get a way out of it through getting some kind of medical designation from a doctor. Oh, I should have mentioned for the tortures, he talks about how doctors were used to help prolong torture by saying, oh, their pulse rate is okay, so you can keep doing what you're doing to them. And then when, if something happened, like if someone died, they would list as cause of death something that doesn't have to do with being tortured. He recounts one officer sexually assaulting the fiance, I think it was, of another officer just because he could. And he definitely points out the we can do anything because the law has no meaning, actually. It's just based on human desire. That was sad. I mean, the whole book is sad. In chapter four with the blue caps, this is where he really mentions that anybody could have become a blue cap and 
this is that famous quote where he talks about the line between good and evil being drawn within everyone and he talks about ideology he says ideology that is what gives evil doing its long sought justification and gives the evildoer the necessary steadfastness and determination that is the social theory which helps to make his acts seem good instead of bad in his own and others eyes so that he won't hear reproaches and curses but will receive praise and honors thanks to ideology the 20th century was fated to experience evil doing on a scale calculated in the millions chapter five is called first cell first love and this is where he talks about prisoners going to a cell and meeting other prisoners for the first time this section he really spends talking about the conditions the daily living conditions how they couldn't go and use the bathroom or relieve themselves in whichever way when they wanted to and how they could only get a certain number of books and how some books talks about food and that was really difficult because they weren't eating very well also about how a lot of books were confiscated and the guards didn't know what they were giving them so they might have been forbidden books but they were still allowed to read them he recounts the lives of some of the prisoners that he met like how they got there and at the end of this chapter it's the end of the second world war they hear it the prisoners and chapter six is called that spring and this one's kind of disheartening because it shows that a lot of prisoners develop hope that there's going to be amnesty and they're going to be released and then uh, he talks about two prisoners one coming out looking totally dejected because he got another five years and then another one coming out laughing because he got another 15 years and that's the mood of that chapter is also about prisoners of wars and people who had fought <clears throat> for russia being betrayed called traitors and sent to the gulags so it's just bad all around he also talks about people possibly trying to send applications and petitions but knowing that no one would actually read them like you could petition on your own behalf to any official you wanted and that was the stated law but actually it wasn't so so that's a brief summary of chapters one to six and this is volume one part of part one i have to put some kind of list so you can see exactly where i am because it's really kind of difficult to follow along uh, so the things that stood out to me from reading thus far were of course how horrible that the torture was also the envy the personal envy required for a lot of this to happen the class envy the personal like because someone you didn't like could possibly get sent to these gulags you would tell on them and then also the blue caps like within their own ranks treating each other badly and then treating the prisoners badly another thing is people submitting people being silent and seeing what was going on but not saying anything because they were afraid that certainly makes me think about current times i also i already mentioned this but i like how he refers back to himself and about how a lot of what he saw happening was something he did as an officer and i think it's true that when you see something happen to someone else i guess without memory you don't think it can happen to you. Something else that stood out to me was the distinction between the city and the rural folks, how a lot of people in the city weren't aware of what was happening when the arrests were first happening and how then later on the city people had to be sent to work on the collective farms even though they didn't know what they were doing. And something else that I thought about uh, was internal and external fission. They exist all the way down so he talks about uh someone a group led by someone called vlasov who was against the communist regime in russia and how people within russia didn't agree like there's always disagreement so even within the blue caps there would be disagreement or there's like a war going on external like russia is involved in a war with the rest of the world but then within russia there's like a lot of fighting going on and then within the nation or a neighborhood there are people telling other people so i'm thinking that there's always frisson going on and this is to me why i just don't buy into collective thinking at all because just that's not how people work they're very distinct and they you know like 
you have commonalities and then you also have differences no matter what level you look at i guess that's what i'm trying to say like no matter what level you look at you see the same sort of interactions play out so how i think this relates to current times obviously the envy the class envy especially in the u.s i think you could apply this to different societies but i mainly talk about US politics. Also, people being silent and going along. It's really, really important for people, even when they're afraid, they're gonna be called some name to say how they think and they feel. I think that's really important. We know for sure that in the US, people on, not on the left, and sometimes not on the super far left, censor themselves more than people on the left. And I think that should stop. I think, if I think about myself, I know I'm a good person. I think I have every right to say what I think and feel. I might have to bear the consequences of that. But why should you be ashamed of sharing your opinion when 20 years ago your opinion wasn't even controversial? You know, like that I think says a lot. 10 years ago even. Yes, people will have bad ideas and you, you want to counter that. And yes, some people will say things that you think are unethical or shouldn't be said. But I definitely think it it's mirrored in what he's talking about with the arrests and how people would just be meek. He used the word meek. How that can turn into people being tortured for their opinions not all of them were uh, political prisoners i also just wanted to give a counter narrative to what i'm saying i kind of mentioned it at the beginning i do really think that this sort of totalitarianism can come from any ideology i don't think it only comes from marxism i think that marxism aka socialism at its end game is maybe more dangerous just because it sounds so appealing and it's like utopian but i think that any ideology can be like this i also found just from looking at the wikipedia article and then clicking on the link modern people on reddit i'll post a link in the description talking about how the economic prosperity at the beginning of the communist revolution was actually good for people in the cities they were using life expectancy as a metric and infant mortality which i think totally ignores what solzhenitsyn focuses on which is like the lived human experience and the torture and it's interesting to me i'm trying to give a counter argument but i'm really like kind of shocked that people would look at that and then ignore all the people who died and they were also mentioning the numbers oh it wasn't that high <laughs> it was high either at the low end of those estimates or at the higher end of those estimates so another question that i've had after reading this far to chapter six the end of chapter six is there's more to this like it already seems so horrifying i understand that apparently it gets better towards the end but I was like, I don't know how much more I can take of all this dark revealing of human nature. I want to end with a quote that happens fairly early on in volume one, where he talks about people being afraid to stop clapping for an applause. I'm going to just read this passage. Here is one vignette from those years as it actually occurred. A district party conference was underway in Moscow province. It was presided over by a new secretary of the district party committee replacing one recently arrested. At the conclusion of the conference, a tribute to Comrade Stalin was called for. Of course, everyone stood up, just as everyone had leaped to his feet during the conference at every mention of his name. The small hall echoed with stormy applause, rising to an ovation. For three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, the stormy applause, rising to an ovation, continued. But palms were getting sore and raised arms were already aching and the older people were panting from exhaustion. It was becoming insufferably silly, even to those who really adored Stalin. However, who would dare be the first to stop? The secretary of the district's party committee could have done it. He was standing on the platform and it was he who had just called for the ovation. But he was a newcomer. He had taken the place of a man who'd been arrested. He was afraid. After all, NKVD men were standing in the hall applauding and watching to see who quit first. And in that obscure small hall, unknown to the leader, the applause went on six, seven, eight minutes. They were done for. Their goose was cooked. They couldn't stop now till they collapsed with heart attacks. At the rear of the hall, which was crowded, they could of course cheat a bit 
clap less frequently, less vigorously, not so eagerly, but up there with the presidium where everyone could see them. The director of the local paper factory, an independent and strong-minded man, stood with the presidium. Aware of all the falsity and all the impossibility of the situation, he still kept on applauding. Nine minutes. Ten. In anguish, he watched the secretary of the district's party committee, but the latter dared not stop. Insanity! To the last man! With make-believe enthusiasm on their faces, looking at each other with faint hope, the district leaders were just going to go on and on, applauding till they fell where they stood, till they were carried out of the hall on stretchers. And even then, those who were left would not falter. Then, after 11 minutes, the director of the paper factory assumed a business-like expression and sat down in his seat. And oh, a miracle took place. Where had the universal, uninhibited, indescribable enthusiasm gone? To a man, everyone else stopped dead and sat down. They had been saved. The squirrel had been smart enough to jump off his revolving wheel. That, however, was how they discovered who the independent people were, and that was how they went about eliminating them. That same night, the factory director was arrested. They easily pasted 10 years on him on the pretext of something quite different. But after he had signed Form 206, the final document of the interrogation, his interrogator reminded him, don't ever be the first to stop applauding. Okay, I hope that was useful. Maybe you never found the time. That's basically my talking about Volume 1, Part 1, Chapters 1 to 6 of the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Maybe you've already read it, but you want a refresher. Maybe you might just be interested in hearing me talk about it. Maybe you want some background information before you dive into it yourself. Definitely let me know what you think. Please, please, please support the channel. If you like this content, it takes time and effort to put it out there. I would really appreciate it if you did that. You can go to justlinkingoutloud.tv slash donate. You can donate for, by PayPal, Patreon, crypto. Let me know if there's something else you want to do. If you sign up for my newsletter, you will see my mailing address. You can send something there as well. There are all these links in the description. I forgot two other reminders. Subscribe to find out what happens next. Also share the video. This is knowledge that I think is important. And if people don't have the time to actually read it, which is always better, maybe they'll have the time to understand what happens in it and how important it is, the concepts. Other than that, I hope you yourself reflect on what this real life account, because it's not a story, it's a real life account, says about human nature and how you might be seeing that play out in your life today. Thank you for watching. Do you know what I wish for you? You might have guessed. I wish that you have a good day. I will talk to you soon. Bye. I'm looking up a video right now on how to pronounce this guy's name properly, even though I've heard it so many times. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. That's wrong. That's not how I've heard people pronounce it. <laughs> Someone says, please remove this. This is disinformation. It is. That is not how people pronounce that name. <laughs> Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn is how I hear, I've heard people say it. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Oh god. This is a thing. Soldier. Okay, someone just said Solzhenitsyn. Solzhen oh god. What? Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I think that's what they did. Will of the Nobel Peace Prize in Literature, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Thank you very much for being with us. Solzhenitsyn. I think that's what he said. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Okay. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn. Sol Sol Solzhenitsyn. <laughs> Solzhenitsyn. Sol Solzhenitsyn. So I guess the proper way is with a bit of a J sound, Solzhenitsyn. But I'm probably just going to say Solzhenitsyn because that's how people say it. But it's Solzhenitsyn. Okay, I think I I think I've got it down. <laughs> Solzhenitsyn. That's what happens when you read 
you read a lot there's so many words i don't know how to pronounce but i know them because i would have read them but i've never heard someone say it out loud i have to have a second monitor to sort of organize all of this information also his first book was called a life in the day of ivan denisovich and they were using um life the uh, what do you call it um life years i can't remember this word uh age you diet life expectancy 